trying to put together is a second type of scientific endeavor where people will sit around the table and, and um, discuss things. It's called a box set. A box set is a bunch of old guys and gals sitting around the table. So that, that's our uh, hope. Uh, and the idea is uh, to take uh, the New York Times Tuesday Science section, read it, and then come back after having read it on Thursday and sit around and discuss it. So the first attempt to do that will be next week. We ask you to read the Tuesday section of the New York Times on next week, and then on Thursday, Bob, what do you think? Okay, Bob, you want to make a correction to that? The science section. The science section of the New York Times. Well, you can read the whole paper, it won't hurt you. But specifically read the science section of the New York Times next Tuesday, and then on Thursday, after the morning lecture at, at noon, go to the Smith Library, bring, bring your lunch, bring a brown bag, sit around uh, upstairs, there's a room that will be reserved for us, and talk about what is, is in the science section. We may uh, direct a little bit in terms of the one or two articles that we'll emphasize. Um, the science section in the New York Times is available in the library. It's available to those of you who have who get the Times. It's also available online. And uh, Bob and I will attempt to bring some copies of that to next Wednesday's lecture for those who want to see it in print. We'll try to bring a few extra copies if people want to uh, read it and don't have access to it by some other method. Uh, but the idea is uh, read the Times science section on Tuesday. On Thursday, come and talk about it in a roundtable, informal discussion over lunch. Okay, let's go ahead and start the program. Uh, today, uh, we are going to have a, a, a presentation by Barry White. He's, has a, he's a math major and a, and a physics minor, and then got, went on and got a, a master of science in physics teaching. He taught math and physics for 16 years and was a software engineer for 25 years. Uh, in his current area of scientific interest, his uh, thoughts arising from cosmology and the modern attempt to unify the standard model and general relativity. Uh, he's enjoying uh, coming to Chautauqua for more than 20 years and uh, managing along with his wife and daughter the Chautauqua Inn. Uh, so uh, today we will. Uh, so we'll have Harry string us along. Next week, <laughs> next, it gets better. next week is a failure. Next week we'll, we'll have uh, uh, Grace talking about uh, the engineering concept of failure, how we learn from failure, and how failure is an option. So we go from being strung along to failing. And uh, please welcome uh, Harry White. It's my Thank you so much for uh, coming this morning. It's nice, nice to see so many people here. Uh, you can see my topic for Newtonian mechanics and string theory, or the road to the theory of everything. <coughs> and the purpose uh, is to show the progression of thought that has led some physicists, I don't say physicists, is that some physicists to seriously consider the merits of string theory. Now, the, the uh, title says from Newtonian physics to string theory, but I'm backing up one step because I can't, we can't appreciate Newton's contribution fully unless we realize that prior to Newton, uh, Kepler came, uh, came along and produced several laws of planetary motion. And they very well described the way the planets move around the Earth, they talked about the period, that is how long it took a fast planet to move around the sun. <laughs> 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 they they uh, very well explained the period of the planets and how long it took the planets to go around the sun. They uh, had a very interesting idea that in equal periods of time, the lock segment drawn between the sun and the planets sweep out equal areas, that is two different equal periods of time, that appears to be, so it's a very interesting theory, and it very, very uh, well done, it was correct. Uh, however, that was a theory of planetary motion. It had nothing to do with the things we saw here on Earth. So terrestrial motion was just a whole different subject. Uh, along comes Sir 
Sir Isaac Newton. And with Sir Isaac Newton's laws of motion and laws of uh, gravitation, we have a convergence. And that's a word I'm going to use uh, often uh, during this presentation. It's really a theme. Uh, it's a thing that drives me in thinking about this. Uh, that we, we take desperate ideas, different ideas, different areas uh, where a certain set of physical laws seem to govern one thing, another set seem to govern something else, and we put them together as a single, a single concept. And that's what Newton did here. He had a, a Newton's laws uh, really very well described both the celestial and the terrestrial, and are sufficient to get us to Pluto. Uh, so his, his laws are still quite good. Uh, I'm sure most many of you are aware that uh, it was yesterday we came close to the coast of Pluto. Newton's laws is pretty much all you need to get there, so they're still pretty good. We need to really understand and appreciate what a good theory in physics uh, has to contribute. And of course, if the theory is going to be good, at all points of contact with measurable reality, the theory was applied. I mean, if you have a theory and you find a, a case where, well, it doesn't apply in this area, though it should, because the theory, it, it, that area is within the realm uh, covered by the theory, well, then throw the theory out. You need something better. So that's a given. You must, the theory must be consistent with relevant observation. But there's two other things that a good theory should do. Uh, one, it should predict something that you didn't expect. You have a theory to explain everything, but it's possible that some different theory could be sort of equivalent and also explain everything. So if you have a theory that, that can predict something, and then you can go ahead and search for that thing and find that indeed that thing is true, that gives some weight to the theory. It makes the theory uh, much more interesting. Newton's laws uh, certainly satisfy that. Newton's laws did a number of things. For one thing, Newton's laws were used along with careful observation to predict that Neptune should exist. And then careful observation showed it indeed. You know, we know it should be here, and careful observation indeed showed it was there. And many, many other things, too many things to list with, with Newton's laws, lots of stuff that goes on there. Uh, long came uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, James Clerk Maxwell. And prior to his work, you have electrostatics. You have equations to describe how electrostatic forces work. And you also have magnetism. You have ideas about how magnetism works. And they're two different things. Uh, at least it's thought of as two different things. Just as Kepler's laws of motion took care of celestial, but not the terrestrial. Different ideas, not too good of ideas, <laughs> uh, did that. Well, when uh, Maxwell came along and, and uh, published his famous Maxwell equations, four beautiful equations that describe the electromagnetic field, lo and behold, magnetism and electricity are part and parcel of the same thing. One set of laws describes fully how those things uh, behave. And but at the time he did that, uh, he was, you know, light was determined to be electromagnetic <coughs> radiation. It was not really known that there are many, many different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation that, you know, the entire spectrum that we know today that really existed. But but <coughs> uh, Hertz uh, did some experiments. Unfortunately, after the death of uh, Maxwell, so Maxwell didn't have the the pleasure of seeing this, but to hurt this some experiments to, to show that indeed you can transmit electromagnetic radiation from one place to another, and there are many frequencies of it, and you have different kinds of phenomena there that occur there. So once again, convergence. Now sometimes you, you could use the word unification here also. You, uh, I like the word convergence here, where you have things come together, but we're also in a sense unifying. We're taking different areas which, which we thought were different, and we're forming a single whole. Uh, 1900 is a, an interesting year and the beginning of an interesting time. Uh, in 1900, Pike discovered that electromagnetic radiation uh, does not 
come in a continuous, you know, any size unit. There's the smallest possible unit of energy that electromagnetic radiation can have. You discovered that that smallest unit of energy, that's the E is in the equation, energy, is, is proportional to the frequency of that radiation. The proportion of constant is called Planck's constant for obvious reasons, since he came up with it. Uh, so so we, we now have the idea that, that even though we, we think of electromagnetic radiation as a wave, you can't have the energy provided in any old, any old size. It has to come in discrete units uh, proportional to the frequency of that light. About five years later, uh, Einstein published the photoelectric effect, for which he won the Nobel Prize, and further uh, ex sort of explained and gave greater understanding to this idea that the energy of uh, uh, electric radiation comes in discrete units. Uh, so uh, the this is a very broad overview, trying to get from Newton to string theory, so obviously I can't go into the details of any one of these things. Uh, if you have questions about these things, at the end, you can ask those. And I'm on campus. I'm in the institution all summer. You can come see me anytime. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> uh, you can't tell that, I'm sure, though. Uh, okay. And one of the things that, by the way, that this brought up was, does, if this energy comes in discrete units, is, is like a particle. You know, prior to this, immediately prior to this, light was very much considered to be a wave. Uh, there were some physicists, including, including Newton, by the way, who gave uh, some thought to the idea it might be a particle, but it was thought to be a wave prior to this particle. We begin to hear the duality of light. It, it has a dual nature. It behaves like a wave. In some situations, it behaves like a particle. In others, so we begin this, this, uh, this uh, This I'm just going to read because this is, a, is an important point I want to, to make about this. So in 2005, special relativity, uh, the advancement of science depends in general on interplay between experimental studies and theory. When you, you see something experimentally, you try to figure out what it is, you come up with a theory of how it works. And this advances science. In some cases, however, theoretical physics adheres to standards of mathematical rigor while giving little weight to experiments and observations. Uh, for example, Einstein came up with special relativity because his concern with the Lorentz transformation that the Lorentz, the Lorentz transformation left Maxwell's equation is invariant. Uh, it simply means the form of the equation doesn't change as you apply, think about special relativity to it. Um, and by the way, one of my uh, references at the end is going to be, if you're interested in something, Google it. You can Google any of these words and you can get a boatload of information about this stuff. Um, so, so that's really something I want to emphasize. There was an experiment. Uh, the, the Dun Microsoft Morley experiment, where they were trying to find the uh, speed of the Earth through the ether. There was a, there was a time uh, prior to 19, uh, 1900 where we thought that space was permeated by some kind of ether, and that ether is what transmitted uh, the electromagnetic radiation and, and all kinds of other things. The Microsoft Morley experiment tried to show our the speed of the Earth through this ether. What it showed was that no matter which direction you looked, light, which should be attached to the ether, traveled at the same speed. The speed of light was, was the same no matter how you looked. Uh, you could be going that way, you could go that way, that way, no matter. The speed of light, was, you got the same measure. This doesn't make sense. If someone's walking toward you, your rate of closure is faster than if the two of you are walking away from each other. But with light, it doesn't behave that way. But Einstein didn't think much about it. He didn't care about that so much. It was the mathematics, and that's my point here. It's the mathematics that uh, interested him in making a beautiful mathematical system. Uh, 1915, he came up with general relativity, uh, where he, he generalized Newton's laws of gravitation uh, with special 
relativity. Uh, special relativity does not involve gravitation at all. It's talks strictly about frames of references moving at constant speed relative to one another. But in general relativity, he considers uh, gravitation also. This is the 100th anniversary, by the way, of this theory. This is 2015. Uh, 1915, he published this thing. So once again, you see convergence here. We have uh, special relativity and gravitation being put together. For Einstein, general relativity was, was not something he thought about because of some pressing empirical problem. Uh, he just, again, from, just from the mathematics, trying to get consistency. Uh, he came up with this. But it did make some predictions. It predicted that light would bend around a massive object. And it was, I think, and I, I should have looked this up, I think it was 1919, because of the late 1921, when there was a solar eclipse. The measurements were done, because you had a solar eclipse, the sun gets blocked out, you can see the star behind it. You knew where the star should be, but when you, when you looked at where it was, slightly displaced, because the light bent around the sun. And uh, not only was it bent, as Einstein predicted, it was bent by the amount he, that he predicted. So here was a, a good example where the three basic criteria you need as the, the theory should be consistent with measurable reality, should predict something, and the prediction should be shown to be correct. And it, it, it meets that. Uh, it also, by the way, explained an anomalous motion of Mercury. They knew this motion existed, but there was no explanation of why it existed. Uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity completely explain that. The other thing that it did was very interesting. Uh, some of you are aware that general relativity can, considers the, the warping of space and time. And so space and time is no longer a fixed platform in which the physics of the world occurs. Space and time is part of that platform and is affected by the things in, in the universe. So it, 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 it's no longer a passive stage, it's an active stage. Uh, and we do have, interestingly, the convergence of two different kinds of mass. There's, there's the, the gravitational mass that people, which is your weight. All of you are being pulled to the, to, towards the center of the Earth uh, by the fact that you have mass, the Earth has mass, you're a certain distance a, apart, uh, and you calculate what that force should be based on those, those ideas. Uh, but there's also another kind of mass, which which is always strangely exactly the same number. If you want to use Newton's uh, F equals ma, force of mass on acceleration, and you try to push something and accelerate it, it turns out the mass of the thing that you determine from that is the same as, as the, the, the mass you would get by considering gravity. Well, Einstein showed, in fact, that these two things were the same. They're equivalent. So we have a convergence of these two different kinds of mass, which uh, and, 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 and an understanding of why. Uh, they are the same. They have the same measurement, but in fact they are the same. Uh, once again, I'd just like to read this. This is from Einstein's autobiographical notes. I have learned something else from the theory of gravitation. No collection of empirical facts, no matter how comprehensive, can ever lead to the formation of such complicated equations. They can only be found through the discovery of a logically simple Mathematical, mathematical condition that completely or almost completely determines the equations. Once one has those sufficiently strong formal conditions, one requires only a little knowledge of the facts to set up a theory. Uh, emphasizing that, that, again, this general relativity is purely out of the mathematics, not because there's some empirical problems trying to solve it, it's out of the mathematics. The mathematics brings the theory to life. There has never been in a hundred years, a violation of the general theory of uh, relativity it is completely accepted by physicists. There's not an example. If we found an example, we can throw the theory out. So far, not. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, we, there was a discovery. Uh, now we're sort of getting back to the you know, the, the Hertz and Planck and all that stuff. The, the idea of quantization is super. But when this thing was discovered, this, this strong and nuclear, strong and weak nuclear forces were discovered. Uh, strong forces brought 
binds protons and neutrons together inside a nucleus. The weak force enables neutrons to change the protons and give it gives off radiation. So those two forces have to do with radioactivity and, and the way uh, atoms hold together. Uh, by the way, some of you know that Einstein spent most of the last part of his life trying to come up with a unified field theory. In trying to do that, he only concerned himself with gravity and electromagnetic radiation. He did not follow quantum mechanics to any extent. He didn't believe in quantum mechanics. And so his efforts through the last part of his life were to bring together two of the four forces, namely gravity and electromagnetic force. Uh, but here we have four forces now. Uh, in quantum mechanics, we were able to converge three of these forces into one theory. The electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force. Again, converge. So we, we converge these into one uh, theory. Gravitation, however, is not part of that convergence at this point. Quantum electrodynamics is a relativistic quantum field theory that incorporates special relativity. So once again, here we have a convergence. We have uh, quantum mechanics and special relativity, and, and quantum electrodynamics puts those together in, in a consistent theory that works and, and has, advanced, has advanced the scientific area. Yeah. In the 50s and 60s, hundreds of particles were discovered. And later it was found that they they are all just various composition, composed of various combinations of quarks. And a quark, up until the 1930, we thought of the electron as a fundamental particle, the proton as a fundamental particle, and the neutron as a fundamental particle. But once we got into uh, uh, you know, a little bit later time, even heading towards the, the 50s, the electron continues to be our, uh, it's, all, it's fundamental. The electron is a fundamental particle, fundamental particle. But the proton is made up of three quarks. And the neutron is made up of three quarks. Different kind, there's lots of different kinds of quarks, about six different kinds of quarks. <coughs> and uh, different combinations of those make different particles. In fact, if some of you have read the latest news, the, I just read this two days ago, CERN has found a new particle, they call it the pentaquark, is made up of five quarks. It's not a fundamental particle, it's a particle made up of five quarks. That, that particle was predicted to exist in 1964. So here we have, just like we had the Higgs boson discovered a couple years ago, this prediction made almost 50 years ago, within this past week, they announced with the pentaquark. And they're still, they're still confirming it. We, it's just, just like when the Higgs boson was first discovered, there were lots of efforts to say, well, is it, did we really find it? So we're still in that mode now. Did we really find a metaphor? But uh, that is where we stand at the moment. That, uh, at least it looks like we have a particle that was predicted 50 years ago, and quantum mechanics has made the prediction, uh, has been vindicated or verified, I should say, not vindicated, but verified once again to, to the discovery of this. There are lots of other things that were discovered, the top four, uh, I mentioned the Higgs boson, uh, that all support the standard model. Uh, as a, I'm not getting into this, just to remind you what the standard model is, it talks about all these kinds of different particles, quarks, leptons, which include the electron, uh, and various Higgs bosons, the Higgs boson, the uh, gluon, the photon, uh, these are the basic particles in the standard model we had last year in this platform, a wonderful lecture uh, by an individual of just about the standard model. Uh, you were all there, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> uh, but the standard model is those theoretically self-consistent, still has some weaknesses. In particular, it does not incorporate general relativity. So with all of the convergence we've had to this point, we still have two areas that have not converged. And, you know, we've not converged them. Namely, we have quantum mechanics and we have general relativity. These two areas have not yet been converged. Enter string theory. Uh, and 
attempt to converge these two areas into the theory of everything. Some of you have probably heard that phrase, the theory of everything. Um, and then one attempt to do this is string theory. Um, the, the problem we have the, where they're not converged, the general activity and quantum electric dynamics are not converged, is, is not something that occurs very often in any ordinary situation. Even in, for the most part, even in high energy physics and so on, you don't run into a problem. You run into the problem, the Big Bang, when we had a tremendous amount of mass in a very small area. And also in black holes, where you have the same situation. You see, uh, gravity, general relativity applies to very high, very massive objects. It applies to hopefully to everything, but we see it. We, we experience the, the effects of general relativity only in the presence of massive objects. Uh, we experience the things that quantum electrodynamics, the, uh, quantum electrodynamics talks about in the world of the very small in particle physics, in, in you know, uh, accelerators, and so forth. We experience this. And most of the time, those things are, are different. You need one theory or the other. But as soon as you get to trying to describe the Big Bang, or to describe what happens inside a black hole, you have to both of those things. You have lots of little particles very close together and a huge mass. And when they try to do that with these theories, something always blows up, mathematically. Uh, we, get, we get probabilities, which you, probability should always be a number between zero and one. If, it, if it's one, it's certain to happen. If it's zero, it's never going to happen. Uh, you put this together, the probabilities become infinite. It makes no sense. So, so this is the problem we have in having these things as separate uh, things. I do mention that there are other theories uh, that are being worked on to try to combine these things. A uh, popular one is loop quantum gravity, uh, and there are several others. And if you if you Google uh, quantum gravity, you'll come up with websites that will tell you all kinds of stuff about these other things. So now, what is the string? Well, up until this point, all of the well accepted physics. We have fundamental particles, little point particles, quarks, electrons, all these little things. With string theory, the idea is they are not the fundamental entity in the universe. The fundamental entity is a little tiny vibrating string. And that string is many orders of magnitude smaller than a proton or electron. An unbelievably small string that vibrates. And the mode of vibration of that string determines the particle that it is. So a certain mode would be an electron. Another mode would be an up quark. Another mode would be a down quark. Uh, every different possible mode gives you, a, you know, a different fundamental particle. The uh, rub of this whole thing is that this theory works only if instead of three physical dimensions plus time, that is a four-dimensional space-time, you need a few more dimensions. And depending where you read, you need six more spatial dimensions or maybe seven more spatial dimensions. I get to know which one is the latest. I need to find out. No matter where, what I read, I see. Sometimes in the same article, I see both of the numbers. So anyway, we need now either a 10-dimensional space-time or an 11-dimensional space-time. And that certainly isn't very intuitive, although there are people even long before spin theory with, with quantum mechanics, many physicists in quantum mechanics will say, if you think you have an intuitive feel for quantum mechanics, then you don't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, we have, this is not a new situation. The fact that you don't have an intuitive feel for it doesn't make it wrong. The standard model has been proven is to be as correct as anything we could ever imagine to discuss, discuss it. There's no discrepancy.